I'm Nana van Tolbe for Biz News, and I have Derek Honecom, the former minister and the interim chair of South African Airway, Airways with me. Hi, Derek. Welcome to Biz News. You, you've been appointed as interim chairperson in April for South African Airways. What's happening with the proposed sale to the Takatso Consortium? What's holding it up, and is it really going ahead? Well, that's the one thing that the board has little to do with, and that is the uh, the partnership that's the bringing in the strategic equ equity partner and all of the deals that were put in place and agreements put in place before we were appointed as a board. So that is between the shareholder and and the uh, uh, Takatsu Consortium. So, um, but obviously we are kept updated, um, although we don't get involved in the details. It's, not, it's between us and government. Uh, it's between Takatsu and government. And we are an intro board for exactly the reason that as soon as the, the deal is concluded, this board's life comes to an end and a new board will, will be appointed to reflect the shareholding, which is 51% to uh, Takatsu Consortium and 49% government holding. And a new board will be appointed as soon as it comes through. So where are we is the question. Um, well, the minister, Minister Praveen Gordon, is quite confident that it will happen before the end of the year. But there are a few um, hurdles to be crossed. Um, some of the questions that have been asked, and including in Parliament the day before yesterday, um, at the SCOPA, the, the Public Accounts Committee, um, was, you know, is the money really available? But that that is a guarantee. If the money isn't made available, the deal falls through. So the and and they have made it quite clear to Katso that they will bring the capital to the table, and the capital is three billion rand over a three-year period. So that represents the capital injection into this new company, which will still be called SAA, by the way. Um, between now and then, uh, the matter of the ruling of the competition commission um, has now been referred to the tribunal, and the tribunal will have to make a ruling on whether it is acceptable or not, whether it accepts the recommendation of the Competition Commission, which was that the Takatsu Consortium had to divest itself of its 20% um, partner, which is Global Airways and another 10% partner, um, uh, Global Aviation, I, I should say, rather. Um, so, and, you know, this is only what I have read, that Global Aviation is not altogether happy about it, but that is between Takatsu and Global Aviation. No. As far as Takatsu is concerned, um, there are a few things that have to be hurdles to be crossed. They have the capital, and um, and as far as the minister is concerned, he's not expecting any major obstacles in the, in the road to it. So we, I want to realistically, assuming nothing goes wrong, Linda. Uh, say that you know within this financial year, by the end of the year or early next year, the deal will have been wrapped up and concluded. So, um, the how many planes is SAA operating at the moment? You could, and I saw you tweet somewhere that you are restarting international flights. Yes, we are, and we'll be doing that quite soon. Uh, it has been reduced to quite a small airline mm -hmm. as we stand now, but uh, you know it was facing liquidation. In fact went into business rescue, came out of business rescue. At the moment, there are uh, seven aircraft owned or leased or owned by SAA. And um, SAA will soon be uh, leasing additional aircraft to bring the fleet up to effectively 13 aircraft. Uh, we have, at the moment, uh, Linda, we have 12 routes, two of them inside the country, domestic routes, Durban, uh, Durban, Johannesburg, and Cape Town, Johannesburg, and then um, quite a number of African regional routes. In fact, ten of them. So that has been expanding um, over the last few months, and then the the plan is for that to further expand. So that by the end of this year, we anticipate having twenty routes altogether, two of which will be intercontinental routes, i.e., international routes, and the first one at this stage it's it's sort of common knowledge, although it hasn't been publicly announced, but the first run on the cards would be the uh, Sao Paulo route. 
Oh, okay. Um, recently, Richard Quest that we interviewed was asking about the long-term plan for SAA. He was asking, you know, are you going to be like Qantas, which funnels so many of its passengers to Dubai and then uses Emirates to fly from there? Or are you planning to actually fly the international routes like you used to? At the moment, but of course, all of that could be changed once the new company is established. But the SAA, as it currently stands, as a 100% government-owned airways, um, we have a, a corporate plan, a five-year plan, uh, prepared by the board which we replaced. But they put a lot of effort into putting together a longer-term plan. And in that plan, uh, we are actually uh, intending to fly directly to you know to a, a variety of destinations we're looking at at the moment we're looking at the the london route the uh, frankfurt route the perth route the new york route possibly new york accra we do currently fly to accra so those are all routes that are being looked at as possible routes um the and that is the plan but of course when takatsu comes in they may have their own plans but meanwhile, we are proceeding with our plans, step by step, incrementally. As I say, we'll be starting with the the first international flight probably in about two months from now, and probably by the end of October, the second international flight. We can't we can't um, sit still, Linda. Um, I mean, on the one hand, the this board has to hold things together, ensure that there's proper compliance with the Public Finance Management Act, that the that. Um, you know, there's a history over the last decade, not a long history, by the way. It happened under state capture um, that uh, things went uh, badly wrong in SAA. A lot of corruption in SAA, which started from right at the top and then filtered downwards. So, you know, a lot of this has been addressed, properly addressed. The SIU has been there for the last, the special investigating unit has been there for the last two years. And a number of these cases are, are already have already been presented to the Hawks for them to take further, or to the prosecuting authorities. So you know that 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 sort of work must continue. Um, and the board board's responsibility is to ensure that at this stage, without any reliance on the fiscus, we we we're not asking the fiscus for any money. That is the shareholder compact that we have. Um, with government, with pu public enterprises, that we will carefully continue managing the process, try to move towards a much more agile, competitive airline, uh, but without um, depending on any um, bailouts from the fiscus, as it were. So we, we're proceeding because, you know, the, 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 the aviation uh, environment doesn't sit still. So they are very good growth prospects and the the signals are very good uh, for return to business in the aviation sector. And, of course, if we delay, other airlines get in. So we, we can't delay for too long because otherwise we'll, we'll lose this potential. Well, one of the other issues that have been flagged is the amount of staff you have that is apparently not appropriate to the size of the airline. Are you thinking of right-sizing staff? Well, I mean, it's it's not been an easy process. I mean, at the moment, it it is more or less right sized, except with the expansion, additional staff will have to be brought in. Right sized in the sense that from an initial eleven thousand odd employees, um, you know, with its its um, closure, what well, its its temporary closure at least, um, there were a huge number of of uh, retrenchments, and it went down to in the company as a whole, not just SAA, but in uh, the um, airships and SAA Technical, which are subsidiary companies, it ca went down to just under 2,000 employees, which is where we are at the moment. But with the resumption of flights and, and with the acquisition of the new aircraft, we will need and are currently recruiting more pilots, new and in particular uh, pilots and cabin crew. But for the rest, it's, you know, it's a very functional airline as we speak. So as far as management is concerned, although it's a difficult period, difficult period because of all of the uncertainty, uh, but in, in reality, we've got very dedicated, very good pilots and excellent, excellent cabin crew. But we will have to expand, and we will. We are expanding. You said you didn't want to rely on the fiscus, but 
you know, taxpayers might be asking, how much longer can you support an airline which has, you know, is which is competing in this open skies environment and has been eroded by corruption? You know, um, it, does it make sense to have a national airline? Well, there are two parts to that question, really. Uh, one is, um, you know, does the is the taxpayer going to be happy with the continued um, bailout, if you like, or, or injection of, of taxpayers' money into the airline? The answer is no, there will be no further injection into the airline. The only costs that are being covered at the moment are the historical costs that have been budgeted for. So a billion rand was received uh, to cover those historical costs, the debts, the uh, the um, unused tickets, and a number of other, other things. The... Um, but no more money is being requested by us from the fiscus other than you know the commitment to to cover the historical debt no more money is 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 coming in and despite that uh, saa and that is very good news although the the accounts still have to be audited we've been through as a board been through the financial statements and for the whole financial year we went through the fourth quarter last week and the um, the the year the financial year ending the 31st of March 2023 sh- actually showed a modest profit. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's a turnaround from where it was before. We're not asking and we will not ask that. That um, message we've been given very, very clearly, there is no more money to bail out SAA. But the second part of your question was, you'll just have to remind me, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we're just asking that, you know, is, is, does it make sense for South Africa to have a national airline? This has been asked with all the corruption. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's a very, really very good question. And um, the answer is, it certainly doesn't make sense to have a national airline, which is going to be a huge burden on the fiscus, which is going to cost the tax, taxpayer an arm and a leg just to keep it running. It, does, it doesn't make sense when there are so many other needs. Um, other airlines, of course, like, you know, there's almost unlimited amount of money coming in. Usually, subsidised people, uh, airlines like Qatar and and um, um, Emirates, etc. Uh, but we 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 have no intention of doing that. Uh, so, the money that went into SAA before, and then a lot of it squandered through corruption and 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 mal uh, administration and mismanagement, etc. That's never going to happen again. Uh, so that's the the end of that. Does it make sense to have a national carrier? Well, there are, there are, there are enormous potential um, advantages in having a national carrier. To say once again, uh, not at this huge expense. It has to be a, a well run, well managed, competitive national carrier. The advantage is in having a national carrier is that you can do certain things. Um, and that is in the current legislation governing the South African Airways, that it should it should act in the interests of the country. So you can do certain things that will, um, where another commercial airline would be hesitant, take on certain routes because of their long-term prospects and because of the trade and the tourism that will flow from having those direct routes, routes to South Africa. So in fact, it is even justified but it's not something that we are considering or entertaining right now. It is even justified in certain cases, not unlimited money, but that a certain amount of money would be, um, you know, modelled differently, so that uh, uh, a route that could even operate at a, a not, you know, at a, at a loss or a temporary loss at least, but brings in tourists that wouldn't otherwise have come, brings in trade that you might otherwise have lost. And so the the actual advantage to South Africa would exceed the amount that it might need to be subsidised. Um, but at the at this stage, Linda, it's not an option. It's not it's not what we're doing. I'm just saying this is the advan- the potential advantage of having a national carrier. I want to give you one example. I don't know how much time we have, but the example would be while I was the minister. That's tour- fine. Thank you. Why while, while I was the minister of tourism. Uh, we saw great growth potential in China, in India, and the uh, tourism tourism was growing as a sector in India quite phenomenally. But we weren't getting our share of that. And so I went there as Minister of Tourism to India, and I met with tour operators, a number of them, 
in Dubai and uh, in Mumbai, sorry, not Dubai, in Mumbai. And, um, and you know, they, they were, um, again, excited about the prospects of increased tourism to South Africa. But they said that there were two factors that um, if they could be addressed, they were confident that they could bring the numbers. The one was easier access to visas. So the visa regime needed attention. Uh, because, you know, if, if you're going to really hassle you, um, to get yourself a visa to get to the country, well, you might just change your mind and go to an easier country. And the second thing was uh, a direct route from Mumbai to Johannesburg, which we used to have, but had been discontinued. Now, there, there, there's lots of investigation that could be done as to the reasons why it was discontinued. And I think they were spurious reasons or even... Mm. Uh, you know, it was discontinued for some of the wrong reasons. But the fact of the matter is that it made it so much more expensive and more difficult for Indian tourists to come to South Africa. And that's why I say, you know, that's where on balance you could say, well, actually this Mumbai-Johannesburg route has enormous country advantages and we will do it even if it is at a loss initially. So it's a different way of modeling it. And I believe that all of our, um, our the South African public and, and commentators and analysts, economists would understand the logic behind it if you could provide the concrete evidence. Nobody's going to say, you know, if you spend a billion rand, subs I'm, I'm using hypothetical figures, you spend a billion rand subsidizing a particular route, but it brings you 10 billion rands worth of trade and tourism. Nobody would question the rationale and the logic of doing that. Um, if I can get to some of the tweets you do, um, well, the airlines are, are, of course, a big polluter, and, but yet you're a very big proponent or supporter of renewable energy, sort of in contrast to some of your former cabinet ministers. I am a very, I mean, I think it's the right way to go. It's not, it's not like, I, it's, it's not something that is sort of idealistic or, you know, it sounds nice to have clean, renewable energy. In fact, it's the best option for South Africa to move towards clean and renewable energy. Um, it, it's, it's, the right, it's the right thing to do, um, not only because of our contribution to climate change, to combating climate change, but also, you know, all evidence points to it to be, be, being uh, cost effective. And, and there's no, there's no um, that's exactly why Germany at this stage has 70% of its electricity is now generated from renewable sources. It wasn't something that they did say this is a nice thing to do. It was a rational and, and sensible thing to do. And so many countries, the shift towards renewable energy is happening in China on a very big scale. So it has to happen here in South Africa. Obviously, you know, we know the arguments of uh, a just, just transition and and you know some of the pain has to be minimized in the closure of the mine in, in using less coal and closing uh, coal-fired um, power stations. Uh, but it wouldn't make sense to invest a huge amount of money now uh, to get uh, to keep coal-fired power stations going when we have a very good alternative, which could generate electricity. By the way, a lot lot sooner than investing in nuclear, for example. Yeah, um, and but there's a big lobby to say no. We've got to do coal and gas now. So don't you agree with that? I think it, you know I'm not disagreeing with government and its approach in, entirely. I mean I think that you know you've got to do in the midst of the crisis that we're in at the moment. You've got to do all the things that you can do that will have immediate uh, positive effects. In other words, you've got to fix the uh, as you know if if they if it's possible to fix them. Uh, this is not really my area, so I'm straying into other people's areas. But obviously, every endeavor has to be made to to normalize the situation and to to deal with the insufficient electricity that we have at the moment. Um, but there will always be lobbies. There will be solar lobbies and wind energy lobbies and people with an interest in it. And there'll be coal lobbies, people with an interest in it. We have to step aside and stand aside from all of the lobbies and say what's best for our country, what provides the best solution to the energy crisis that we have, the quickest solution, a long-term solution, and at the same time contributing towards the uh, global attempt, which is critically important to, to combat uh, climate change and, and to, to contribute towards lower emissions in, in the world. 
You, you linked the question to um, airlines and the pollution from air, you know, from aircraft. Well, you know, nobody's saying, well, don't fly. Nobody's saying don't drive. But the shift towards, um, uh, you know, lower emitting vehicles and electric vehicles, hybrids and electric, it's a significant shift that is happening globally. And so, of course, uh, it's 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 a lot easier with um, vehicles on the road than it is with um, long haul airplanes. But the fact of the matter is, even airline companies are looking at alternatives. Um, but for the moment, um, you know, we it's not it's you know you're faced with these stark choices. Do you just um, abandon trade, and which you can't? You can't abandon trade and abandon travel and abandon tourism. By the way, tourism contributes a, a great deal towards our South African conservation efforts. So, you know, because without tourism, a lot of the conservation efforts that we have in South Africa would would just simply not have the funds to continue with them. I've seen many tweets that you had on um, the Defend Our Democracy campaign. Is that a UDF reboot? Not really, uh, Linda, but it is linked to, um, you know, some you know, sort of rebooting efforts side on, on from a number of people who were part of the UDF as in 40 years ago now. So there's a there's a significant 40-year celebration being planned, a 40-year anniversary celebration being planned. And in the process of planning it, now people are going back, looking back at the values and the ethos and the, the way the UDF um, mobilized so many people at the time. And so, of course, so the... In society as a whole, um, and even more so amongst uh, those who were active in the anti-apartheid struggle, um, there's there's some disappointment, a level of disappointment at the things that have gone wrong. Now, obviously, the things that have gone wrong um, in our own democracy, that doesn't mean that a whole lot of things haven't gone right and that things haven't changed positively, but there are things that are obviously... Um, that the public is very unhappy about. And so there's a very strong feeling that government has to be held to account, that we need better governance. Uh, but the the uh, Defend Our Democracy was really something that was born at a time just about two years ago, if you recall, when there was this um, sort of unrest, particularly in KwaZulu-Natal, and there was, uh, you know, it, and, and there was a feeling um, that... Um, there were people who were who were instigating, who were behind a popular uprising, but uh, not a popular uprising based on noble ideas of what kind, what we need to get right, but based on defence of the of of corruption. So, um, and people were starting to defy the constitution openly, including the former president of South Africa completely defying the constitution and ending up with a prison sentence um, as a result of that. And so that was seen by a number of people spearheaded by Frank Shikani, Reverend Frank Shikani, and other prominent figures to say, look, we, um, the people of South Africa at the end of the day are the last line of defense. If we're going to have uh, people, sort of a mob mobilization in uh, threatening our democracy, um, then there has to be counter-mobilization of people who will stand up to defend our democracy. And so that that was the origin of Defend Our Democracy. Defend Our Democracy has since grown. Uh, we, we, the democracy itself is not under the kind of threat and the constitution as it was two years ago. But at the same time, um, the discussions that are have, taking place at the moment are about making this democracy more meaningful to people, making our constitution a more of a living document so that everyone in South Africa enjoys the constitutional protections and the constitutional rights that they deserve. And, and democracy itself, deepen it, make it meaningful, make it more participatory. Uh, so, you know, part of the Defend Our Democracy campaign, by the way, it, it has now been launched as an organization just a week ago. And part of it is to just promote an active citizenry. So it's not going to you know, go to the um, election next year as a political party? You know, I'm not, I can't speak for Defend Our Democracy, but I did attend the launch, and that's not the intention, no. Uh, but the intention is that the, 
you know, the obviously we we take a lot of things for granted, Linda. Um, in many countries, you know, um, elections either don't take place or they're challenged every year as not having been free and fair. Well, that that we've had in South Africa several elections at local government level, provincial and national, that have never been challenged. So free and fair elections, that is one essential part of a democracy. But at the moment, what we've seen is declining participation, declining uh, vote, uh, 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 people coming out to vote. And so whether that's apathy or whether it's disillusionment, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, if if we need change and positive change, and I'm not talking about changing one party for another, but making this country a better country, uh, we need the active involvement of all of our citizens, but with, with the correct kind of orientation and the correct motives, the right motives. And the motive should be that, you know, we, we love our country, uh, we want our country to, we want a more inclusive economy, uh, we don't want corruption in our country, and we are going to hold all political parties to account. I have spoken to a political analyst this morning, Pete Crocomp, which you probably know, and he was worried where the ANC's money is coming from. And I saw a tweet from you where you were also asking at one stage, where's the ANC's money coming from? And, you know, which raises the question, is the ANC currently selling its soul and the country out to Russia? Why this insistence to support Russia and say it's non-aligned, but it looks as though it's supporting Russia. Sorry that I have to ask you this, but you know, you've been knee deep into the struggle into ANC politics, was a government minister for the ANC. So I thought I'd ask you this question. Yeah, that's a question that I I cannot answer uh, because I'm not a spokesperson for the ANC. Uh, so there are a number of these issues that the right people should respond to, not not myself. Derek Honeycomb, thank you so much um, for, for the insights. And we were definitely watching the space of South African Airways. Do you fly South African Airways? Well, there was a time when I, I took the most, I, I try, I've always tried to fly South African Airways, but, you know, because of convenience, I've had to use other airlines from time to time. But now that I occupy this position, I only fly South African Airways. And I must tell you, the experience is a wonderful one. It's a really good one. And I get this feedback from many, many people. So there are other airlines and and we need them. We needed them desperately when SAA was no longer flying and and um, and that's fine. The competitive environment is always healthy. But I believe when it comes to customer service and the flight experience, I don't think there's any other South African-based airline that can match South African Airways. Thank you, Derek Honakon. 